Lisa, thank you so much for joining me in a conversation about insects and music. Thank you for asking me to have this conversation. Really happy to have you. So I want to start off by talking about your love of revealing hidden sounds. And I wanted to know what can be gained by unveiling or revealing hidden or inaudible soundscapes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, hearing or realizing sounds that are beyond our hearing takes like a, a deeper level of of paying attention to place um, to where you are or where you've been. And um, so like the, if the visual is like the dominant way that we talk about the world, it tends to be at least in media, our language is tended towards the visual. Um, we imagine things like image, you know, then there's been a movement towards sound to like emphasize listening more. And of course, the most obvious thing is to listen to what we can hear. Right. And that's super important. But then to go beyond that um, and hear and consider what we can't hear kind of pushes us to this realm of considering a non-human point of being, like a non-human, not only non-human or beyond human listening positionality, but a beyond human living perspective. And um, knowing that, and also it just, it just takes this humility to like, um admit that like there's so much we can't know like there's so much we can't even hear so i mean you know and i love science <laughs> i i make art that entangles itself with science and i used to practice science in a more formal way um so it's not that i'm denying science or i don't like it but it's just like there's so much that we can't know or don't know or don't know yet you know and even when we think we know something we're seeing it we're, we're seeing it we're hearing it through our own perspective our own limited perspective a fabulous perspective is like limited so yeah as an entomologist i have a search image for insects as you do too so we go out and we really have a keen um perception of insects flitting about scurrying about and i grew up in a temperate zone just outside of detroit with cicadas during the summer and of course crickets, but honestly, I didn't open my ears as much as I could have, and I think should have. And it took me going to a workshop at the Ark of Appalachia in Ohio, where uh, Will Hirschberger, who's a co-author of, you probably know the Songs of Insects. Yes. An amazing book where he's photographing and recording and really having us sit or stand and just listen at night during the day and then an audio world was essentially opened up to me with layer upon layer that i i think i was treating as wallpaper yeah that reminds me of something interesting that happened um recently um i did a project so i live in troy new york now and i'm attending school here and I've been doing some projects with the Sanctuary for Independent Media, which is an awesome independent media org and radio station. And they have like all these gardens and um, they have, um, and they host different projects. And one of them is this lawn lab that um, a colleague of mine, Ellie Irons, developed for her PhD dissertation. Anyway, so I've been doing something on Ellie's installation which is a lawn with all different like kind of plants coming up that were in the seed bed before it was paved over with asphalt she kind of opened it up and then brought in new seeds the insect environment there is like unreal so you're walking down this block it's a neighborhood with some trees like not a huge canopy cover and then all of a sudden you hear this soundscape and it just like hits you um when you get to this area but i set up an installation it was called the insects are present it was um kind of riffing on Abramovic's work that she did at MoMA where she sat at a table and the public took turns sitting and um, with her in this like uncomfortability and intensity. So that was the idea to get people to listen to these hidden sounds of insects and headphones with all the mics in real time in the vegetation oh, kind wow. of the soil. But so the idea was these hidden sounds 
but I had a waiting area because I wanted to make sure that only one person at a time was over in the focused listening area and everyone else was like a distance away, like a chit chat if they wanted. Um, and everyone said that when they even got to the waiting area, that the soundscape that they could hear was so much more present than it ever had been when they had come to that place. And so like just before they even heard the hidden sounds, they were way more aware of the sounds we could hear. Um, so it was like, like you're saying, like this, like it just opens up kind of like we have a search image, like we're not going to notice the ants on the leaves of the vegetation unless we're cued into them, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And so like all of a sudden you have this like an audio um, oralization. So, oh yeah, good. And, and you and you you've written about and borrowed the term oralization could you describe that yeah so um pauline oliveros is was um an incredible composer an artist a writer she um worked at a few different universities rensselaer polytechnic institute where i am right now being the final university she worked until until she passed away in 2016 and um she did all this amazing like experimental sound work from the 60s on and um I wish I could talk about for hours but one thing she did she wrote this paper called oralizing in the sonosphere and it was all about there being a lack of vocabulary to talk about sound and how we default <clears throat> to visual based language and she took the word um oralization from an architecture um, from the field, from the field of architecture in architecture oralization is used for modeling so like you want to know how this piano is going to sound in this room compared to that room or should we how should we build the room so you build these models and you set, do an oralization more or less it's like a kind of figuring out how sound was going to act in the space and so she took that word and also used it to apply to sounding sounding in the mind so not only so creating sounds in your mind so but also um so creating them yeah yeah creating sounds in the mind and hearing in the mind so like so you can make sounds and you can also hear sounds in your head so you could like compose a, a song or like you can have an earworm in your head all day from the radio that's a type of oralization it's sound in your head um so yeah instead of imagination so it's the sonic parallel to imagination um which you, is really you, we use we use for all the senses imagination but imagination really image it has image at its root it's really visual do you think of all the sensory modalities sound is most linguistically deficient or do you think smell or taste or touch like doesn't have the language to describe it i think oh so i work closely with the woman ali wist who's all about chemical sensing so taste and smell and so she talks about that language a lot and yeah it is lacking also and it's really particular to certain industries where they develop it further like people in the perfume industry or coffee um, I think have a more developed vocabulary with that. But yeah, overall, I'd say it's lacking as well. Yeah. Talk about insect sound. Would you say sound, noise, music? And when do you distinguish among the insects and, um, and among the sounds you hear? Sound, noise, music. Yeah. Okay. So those things have complicated definitions right um so noise noise in the sort of most common popular understanding means undesirable sound but if you're a sound artist it just means like sound that is like covering all frequencies equally so like you know white noise or something like that or pink noise or so if you add noise to something you're kind of like fuzzing up the timbre you're just like you know um so noise, huh, but huh what is pink noise it's a type i'm totally 
blanking on the difference, but there's white noise, pink noise, and brown noise. And okay. they're all different kinds of noise that kind of fill the spectrum. So it's like, instead of, you know, timbre is defined by like where, what frequencies you have present, right? So like a clarinet is going to sound different than a trombone. Um, but you only have certain, certain harmonics har present. But in noise, it's just like everything's going on. So it's just like this, you know. And that's um, not annoying to you. No, you, you don't I mean, have you don't uh, ascribe negative connotations to noise. Mm -mm. Is that right? But that's not the popular definition. The popular definition of noise is someone like banging on their roof um, all day, fixing something and bothering you, know, or like a really loud car going by, or like a loud, um, a loud person. You know, it's noise. Oh, it's really noisy in here. You know, I can't hear you talking. So it's different um but um i don't i mean i find some noise undesirable i can't stand the sound of like generators or leaf blowers um or like pressure washers um but that's not really it's yeah so the noise has a really socially kind of embedded meaning and then it has a meaning within the sound world but with for insects um I'd say like noise, I, when I think of noise in the insect world, I think of noise that might disturb them. So um, like, or that they might perceive and feel neutral about. Um, so they sense a lot of insects sense sound through vibration or most insects do. And so if a car drives by, you assume that they would sense that vibration in some way um, if they're nesting nearby it. So, that could be noise then if we want to think of it in a negative way, if it's going to disturb them, if it's going to create a disturbance and let them communicate less effectively or throw them off or yeah, anyways, noise and then sound and music that like makes me think of like my own work because like I feel like it's on this boundary of sound and music if I perform it with a band in a music venue, it seems like music if I put it the same song on loop in an installation with four speakers, it seems like sound art. They're all, it's all sound. Usually music is meant to be like a fixed composition. Um, sound art, more like fluid. But so with insects, it takes on a more like, it, I feel like it gets into this, this um, are insects sentient? Are insects, do insects have abstract thought? All of these questions that most people in science don't hardly touch, you know? Um, because in order to make music, it seems like there's also implied that there's this sense of enjoyment or um, intention for it to be like leisurely or, you know, <laughs> creative, um, which I think that like, who knows, again, back to this, we don't know, you know, um, but sound, music, I mean, it's all one in the same, I, I don't know, sure, I think calling the insect community acoustic sounds or acoustic music and music is giving is assuming a little bit more that it's on shaky ground but yeah i really like how you uh interpreted my question from the, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, was that like what you were thinking no that's beautiful i was thinking from an anthropocentric a human vantage point but you mm -hmm. flipped it as you often do in your work and you think from an insect's vantage point so the idea, and few people, I think, would really contemplate the notion that insects could perceive noise in that, with the connotation you 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 said rightly that humans mm -hmm. adopt, and that's this annoyance factor, right? Uh, yeah. And and then the idea of sounds and music. So a little bit later, I'd love to get into the different musical sounds that insects produce but i'd love first to talk about something that's very important to you and to your work mm -hmm. and that's not only bridging the science with the art particularly music but thinking in terms of environmental policy and i want to to think aloud with you about ideas in which art and especially maybe uniquely music can educate, advance notions, or even cause changes in policy 
with regard to human induced environmental destruction. Yeah. So um, one historic example that um, has motivated me and inspired me is um, um, the 1970 album, The Sounds of a Humpback Whale um, by Roger Payne, who passed away recently. And so like, so no, so humans didn't know about these or Western modern humans didn't know about these um, sounds that whales make to communicate and entertain themselves and wherever else until like the 70s and Roger Payne was one of these main people that researched it and um, so not only did he and his colleagues release scientific papers, but they released this album, which I have. There. From National uh, Geographic, is that right? I don't think it was. Oh, because there was a there was a revolutionary insert in National Geographic, I believe, uh, that played humpback whale sounds, and that. I that... got this album. I'll show you. Oh please. Oh. Yeah. Wow, yeah. So this album, Songs of the Humpback Whale, it was released on CRM Records. Okay. But Thanks. yeah, I'm sure there was probably also something in National Geographic because it became like international news. And like, I've read that this album like sold like, was like one of the most highest selling albums ever. Like, um, wow. Yeah, and it's incredible. Actually, the cat gets freaked out whenever I put it on. <laughs> but um, so anyways, the, my point is this album had a really cult, huge cultural impact, but also it ended up affecting policy because everyone got, became so aware that um, conversations about restricting whale hunting started really developing and were established and policies regulating it were established soon after. So I believe like, I mean, it's difficult to have the same kind of impact now because we're so bombarded by media everywhere. There's so much media, um, but I still believe that there is possibility. And I think like this kind of format is really impactful. I don't, fewer people have record players, but something that is like asks you to sit with it, I think has more impact than something on social media. Of course we love stuff on social media, but so I, I try and think about that in my work, like what, how can I get people to sit with something rather than experience it like in a flash moment and then forget about it right after. So, um, yeah, so that I think there's a lot of potential in influencing policy concerning insects. And in, in order to influence policy, you need to influence people's opinions and thoughts concerning um, the affected organisms. So getting people to even if they're not going to like insects more, but getting them to respect insects more, um, I think it's really something that art and music can do. Um, and can you tell me, us, about the Hawaiian Hylaeus project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the last time I like properly worked uh, as a biologist was for the um, Xerxes Society for, conser for um, Conservation of Invertebrates. Yeah. And... Um, in Portland, Oregon. And so um, they knew I had been to Hawaii previously to be an intern at USGS Kilauea to work on ants there in Bob Peck's lab. And um, so they knew I was really passionate about tropical ecology and, and ants. So they put, um, and um, Hymenoptera in general. So they put me on task for this Hylaeus project. Um, so the Hylaeus are a genus of bees that are cosmopolitan. So they occur in over, I think, six continents or something, I'm not sure. But um, in Hawaii, the Hylaeus are the only native bees. Um, and there are no like native social insects in Hawaii. So no native ants, no like social bees, like um, honeybees or bumblebees. And yeah. can I interject? So uh, to say native for Hawaii is really confusing, at least to me, because you have this archipelago of volcanic uh, eruptions and nobody was native initially so yeah. where is the arbitrary and i'm you know obviously have this bias yeah. where is the arbitrary cutoff where you say 
no, goats are not native, or this bird species is not native. Bats, you know, and insects. So at what point do people generally say, nope, this is a newcomer, this is an invasive species? I think like once humans, well, for Hawaii, it feels really different because they're for, you know, the human presence there is more recent than in other places. So I, there's sort of like when Polynesians got there, there's that cutoff point, but there's also the cutoff point when Westerners got there. Mm, okay. Um, but the thing is, what is native? Because the bees that are there got there like because they happen to be like nesting in a log that floated. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and so it's like everything got there somehow. Um, yeah. Because right now there are uh, beekeepers in Hawaii and have been for a long time yeah. with Apis mellifera honeybees. Mm -hmm. are, and I assume they're bumblebees. Yeah. Okay. Oh, bumblebees? No. I've seen carpenter bees there. I'm not sure if there's okay. bumblebees. I haven't seen bumblebees. There might be. And are there what would be considered in this context invasive solitary bees? So there's when we are out looking for the Hylaeus, we'd see like a lot of serotina, uh -huh. which looks very much like it, and they're more abundant. Whether or not they're out competing them, maybe. But the Hylaeus always like seem very easily outcompeted by anybody else. This is one of the reasons they're in this huge decline. Um, but the biggest like threats to the Hylaeus always seem to be invasive ants. And I use the word invasive, that's a really heavy word too. Um, but ants that are really highly successful and have taken over large areas of land, especially in the lowlands. They only get to a certain elevation, but um, so the and they're really aggressive and the Hylaeus are not really good at protecting themselves and so um and the Hylaeus aren't social so they don't have that sort of social cohesion that offers like better protection in different ways and numbers and cohesion and, and like these behavioral strategies but but you could explain better than I am but um but yeah so there's different species that have been introduced that have impacted the Hylaeus. Um, and the other thing is loss of habitat because they're really tied connectly to native plants that they pollinate. And so the native plants have been in decline and they need certain plants um, to, uh, for their host plants. Um, yeah. And you co-authored a paper to influence change in recognizing these Hylaeus species as being in trouble, right? Yeah, yeah. So what they put me on task to do at the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation is to work with um, entomologist Carl Magnaka, who still works in Hawaii, to look at this genus in Hawaii. There's 60 something known species that were at one point in Hawaii. And that's another thing that kind of like the marker of what's native and what's not is like this genus evolved um further it like branched off in hawaii after like whatever lucky bee floated there on a log like you know there's a speciation there like there have been in other insects there like the dragonflies and the evolved like weird tactics there there's just strange strange creatures there but anyways so there's 60 something species and they're all not doing very well and no one had really looked at them until since the 90s when Carl had last looked at them for his postdoc work and before that nearly 100 years had passed and someone had looked at them this guy Perkins who did all this exploration in Hawaii so they said Lisa talk to Carl figure out which bees are the best candidates to petition to put on the federal endangered species list so we looked at maps we looked at what he had found and so you want to find candidates that have like a chance of surviving if we try and protect them right um so we rounded it down to seven species and wrote petitions to the federal government to get them listed as endangered species it took about seven or eight years but they were listed eventually and they became the first bees to be listed on the federal endangered species list in the U.S. Did that lead to the more recent further protections for bumblebees, for example, do you think? I mean, I don't know if it would have been like less likely to happen if it hadn't mm. happened. I mean, bumblebees are way more 
known to people. So you would think they might have had an easier, maybe if bumblebees had come first, it made it even easier for Hylaeus. But I think, I don't know, it might have happened anyways. But, but I think the process takes so long and there's so many obstacles to something getting listed. Um, and there's way fewer insects listed than other taxa um, or have been historically. So, yeah. What words of advice would you have for others who wish to protect what for them are charismatic microfauna? Yeah. Um, the Xerxes Society has like developed a model that has been successful with a lot of different species. Um, they've fought for protecting like a whole range of taxa. And um, I think just like contacting them is actually a great way or looking at their website to see like the steps that they've taken. Um, they've started a lot of citizen science projects. Um, so, and there are more and more citizen science projects in existence. And that always seems a good way to get the data, to get the picture, to see what is happening in a place, you know? And then the petitions themselves um, seem really arduous, but once you do one, there's kind of a model to it. Um, and yeah. And how can sound or music play a role? Can there be an insect humpback whale movement? I think so. I think there can be. And I've seen an impact. I mean, my own parents, I mean, they are my parents, but like, I would say that they, and they've always been people who respect non-humans, non-humans, that um, they're way more passionate about insects than figuring, finding out about them and stuff since we've been talking about them together. Um, and other people that I share my work with, they seem to have like this excitement and like the same thing happened for me, you know, when people taught me about insects at first, um, my first professors with them, I just was already interested, but I just like dove in deep, you know, so I feel like there is a potential and it's through, I don't know, I, I think that like if you read like devastating news in you, if you read about insects, in the form of negative news like climate change we're doomed blah, blah blah there's an infestation of insects happening because of climate change there's nothing that connects you with the insects themselves you're just overwhelmed with this narrative of doom so through music and art you could actually bring it to the insects themselves and um, beyond this like you're getting to like this labeling of a, being an infestation or an invasion or like a disappearance and decline and more like thinking like oh this insect's really cool oh my god it does these amazing things look it's beautiful look how it moves i really am interested in this insect and then that your own decisions in your life or if you are in position of power could be influenced by this respect this newfound respect for insects um, and curiosity for them or just even recognition that they're there that they exist um so that's what i think i think art is just like an accessible way to get to know insects um and music specifically um because it's a nonverbal language. So I can go to Brazil and play insect sound, just the same insect sounds in music as I do here. How bad or good my Portuguese is doesn't matter, right? Like it's like, um, although I am improving. So um, it's like music is a global language. And the good thing about it, and the amazing thing about it is it doesn't require words. It's an emotional communication. It's an emotional information also that music can communicate um do you ever feel yeah. do you ever feel like when you're recording insect sounds that you're recording the last vestiges or what could be the disappearing languages of insects in the same way that i imagine linguists feel when they're recording and trying to transcribe or save disappearing human languages? It depends where I'm recording, I guess. So when I did this project in Troy recently, I'm recording on a, what has been like a really severely impacted area of land that had this amazing diversity of insects and insect sound. So it's this place of resilience in the middle of a city. And so there it felt like, no, this is actually the soundscape that will mm -hmm. probably 
survive. This is more of the soundscape mm. that we'll have. When I'm in Hawaii and I was, we were looking for the Hylaeus. So I was, and um, at that point, what I was recording was the soundscapes of their habitats rather than of the bees, because they're really hard to find and they're really fast and really small. And I hadn't like had access or knowledge about the techniques to possibly record them at that point and still haven't gotten back to try it. So, um, but still recording the soundscapes of those habitats, I really felt like I was recording things that were threatened that might change um, where the species that are present um, may not be present in the future. So it really depends where you are. Have you ever been tempted to be involved collaboratively with researchers who record soundscapes from a conservation lens? So to see how uh, insect declines can be detected through acoustic measures? Yeah, there's a lot. I've never like formally been involved, but I'm really interested in that kind of work. Um, and like, there's a lot of like passive acoustic monitoring that they do where there's like durational recordings and they're really looking at, you know, comparing places over time or comparing different sites that have been impacted differently, right? I've never done that, but I really want to. And actually it's something that I've been like in the back of my head as like a postdoc because it would be really cool to approach something in a way where I can do a comparative study and then that data um, can be used for science analysis and can be used to make music also, which is actually what I've been doing different kinds of studies with entomologists in Brazil for a few years. Um, it's not a conserv it is a conservation study in that like we really want people to think about and know about insects and in particular ants more. So it's conservation minded study, but it's not um, more directly related to conservation biology. Let's yeah. talk about your music. So you've taken steps to deliberately, intently, with uh, intention, bring insects into your music mm -hmm. or create insect sounds, right? And I'm imagining that many, most musicians around the world might do so unconsciously. So everyone has an experience with very few exceptions on the planet with soundscapes that include insects and that can become ingrained in your psyche. And I imagine can translate into music in very subtle ways. Mm -hmm. what is, what, how do you feel your music differs with that intentionality? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's a lot of really wonderful writing recently um, about these origins of human music in beyond human sounds and music. Um, yeah, so this is a thing. And like, I've definitely been influenced by that. Probably have like the sounds of like Staten Island and New York City embedded in my head from my youth too, influencing. I might write music. Um, but yeah, there's an intentionality about it. Um, so the best analogy that I can draw is like in the past and in the present, I've been in bands where we say, okay, we really want to get some new ideas. We want to go in a new direction. It might be because we have a lack of ideas at the moment, or we just want to like have some newness. And so we'll say, what should we listen to? And someone will bring an album and we'll like listen to it over dinner or in the car or whatever. And like intently, um, like rather than in the background um, and talk about it and then play music and see through not a process of mimicry, but see how it rubs off to, to copy the vibe or the feeling. Um, so that process, I feel like is exactly what I'm trying to do listening to insects um, i'd love for i'd love to for you to explore that a little bit more so yeah. what does it mean to mimic and what does it mean to capture the the vibe of yeah so mimic in my mind i've done this and it's a process that i do do intentionally i in composition sometimes mimic 
Um, so mimic to me would be to hear a bird go like bump, 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 um, or a cricket go, you know, chir, 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 chir. you know, uh, that's a really bad cricket. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to do that exact same pattern in the percussion or in the synthesizer, or whatever, and copy it exactly. So I'm really rhythmic based, right? So to me, mimicry is rhythmic. Um, and for me, the, the pitch or the notes <laughs> always feel more flexible and it's still mimicry to me if the rhythm is there. So that's, that's just me. Um, the vibe would be more like this insect has a chaotic pattern of when they speak, but when they do speak, there's a sort of like density to it. And there's um, a sort of rhythm that's common. Like I was listening to this ant that I recorded, these ants I recorded um, here upstate in the Catskills last month at a residency. Uh -huh. And I think, I'm pretty sure I didn't identify the insect yet, but I think it was Tetramorium immigrants. Like, so this really abundant yeah. cosmopolitan ant. And it kept going like, da, 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 da. So there was this sixteenth note feeling to it that happened in different patterns, and so um, if I was to get the vibe of that, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna write something with sixteenth notes. But the space in between those bursts of sixteenth notes was just like varied. So that would be the vibe, right? So it's like kind of mimicry, but it's like also like, okay, the vibe is the overall musical feeling yeah. is no straight meter um it's kind of unpredictable there's a 16th note feeling i write that you know um so as opposed to mimicry which would be to exactly copy it i'm gonna play something yeah hvac oh cool I'm playing a portion within the middle and we're hearing almost theremin sounds with little jitters and skitters. And then the drum, the percussion starts coming in. I'd love for you to talk about that composition and your collaboration there and and how that difference between mimicry and the vibe plays out in HVAC. Yeah, so that is a favorite of mine. Um, so HVAC is a composition that originates with a recording I made in Manaus, Brazil, on the Federal University of Amazonas campus at UFAM in the city of Manaus. UFAM is a very special place. It's a university surrounded by tropical rainforests. And that's the biggest remaining forest fragment within the confines of Manaus, which is a city of 2 million people, a big city. There's a big forest in a big city. And um, so the forest comes up to the edge of a lot of the buildings on campus. Um, and so there's things like amazing, like huge leaf cutter ant um, nests. So this song was recorded entirely inside leaf cutter ant nests, about six inches down the nest entrance. So like kind of threaded into my microphones down inside the nest. And at various nests, I captured the sounds of ants, so stridulations of ants, and also the sounds of HVAC systems, so air conditioning systems in the nearby buildings. And this is in the tropics. These air conditioning systems are running all the time. Mm. Um, and those buildings have been there a long time. So I'm not sure, and I actually want to look into this, but I think the ants built these nests after the buildings were already existing, after these air conditioning systems were running. Um, so uh, this sound, this song really considers like, oh, like, what is this effect of what we could say maybe noise on the insects in their nests, on the ants there, um, but it also just like points at this like fascinating sound system that's happening right, literally like next to where the students are learning. Um, it's beyond our hearing. So um, I took these sounds and I put them into a composition through a collaboration, I guess you could say it, they didn't voluntarily collaborate, but a collaboration with the ants. 
and the air conditioning system and my friend Jane Pike. So I was doing an artist residency at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn when I was putting this all together after having collected these recordings. And Jane um, happened to be in town. She's someone I've collaborated with on and off for like over 20 years. So I said, can you come by the studio? Um, we can hang out and I would love for you to contribute to this song. Jane is incredible with her voice. She also plays guitar and um, and uh, so, but I asked her to do vocal improvisation. And we've done a lot of improv in the past together. And I said, um, you can mimic or free respond or just basically do a mix of that. Um, so, and I was like, think about, I'm trying to remember exactly what I said to her, but I was like, think about if we were like trying to communicate with the ants, like, trying and you're trying to get to know their language um through your response yeah it's like you're practicing their language through mimicry but just getting the feeling of it and experimenting with it um so and she did like some amazing stuff with her voice to the point that sometimes in the song you can't tell like what's the aunt what's jane what are the ants um and um the other element in there is my drumming, so I had the same approach with it. Um, I think I have to put the cat outside. Hold on. <laughs> you are part of it. So Shane, I love the cat actually, tail. I think Shane is like a really wonderful percussionist. He's always making. <laughs> um. But um. He really does make amazing sounds. He just <laughs> but so, and then, so the drums, so I had the same approach there. And um, so we were not only mimicking and free improving on the ant sound, but also the air conditioning. And we did those in separate takes. So in one take, I said, Jane, let's focus on the ant sound. And I played the ant sound for her on a loop and she improvised. And then we did the same with the air conditioning. And then we did one take where me and Jane improvised together with those sounds. So we're not only responding to each other's ideas and building on them, but also to those sounds. Um, and then I took all this material and built it into a composition. And then also took the ant sound and um, you can do something in Ableton Live where you basically generate a MIDI file. So like a musical code file that then you can put any sound into it. So I put like a basic kind of sine wave mm. to modulate that ants modulated based on that ant sound. So that's also in there. So there's like a basically synthesizer mimicking ants also. That's like their beep, 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 beep. it's the more kind of pure tone in there. But um there's a Colombian artist and uh, engineer who creates wearable devices so that you can try to get a feel for what it's like to be a sea turtle or a bat. And by communicating in that way to Jane Pike, did you feel like you were somehow getting closer to your acromermix subjects? Communicating that to Jane? When you were doing the back and forth during that experiment, uh, was that a way for both of you to in some way feel more like the ant or try to better understand what the ants are experiencing? Yeah. So yeah, is it was a personal experience for us. Like mm -hmm. really, yeah. And Jane having not been in Manaus, this is she I showed her pictures mm -hmm. of where the sounds were recorded, but she hadn't been to that place and wasn't there listening with me originally. Yeah. And so there was this information being exchanged um and a learning and a really personal experience that we we're having in that moment of learning of learning like of the the dynamics of the ant sounds this is this like stretch of recording that we're listening to um and i want to mention david dunn he's um a mentor of mine he's on my dissertation committee he's a composer an artist and he in addition to making incredible compositions um, using different systems he's developed of technology and of environmental response. And um, he 
um, also has done a lot of writing and speaking to the capacity of music to communicate um, and uh, the capacity of music as a learning tool, as a communication tool. Um, and one being that is much more has much more potential than human language to communicate about beyond human and beyond human communication, because it has, like you were saying, there's more in common between our music and their language than there is between our verbal language and their language is what he gets to, which kind of gets back to this, like um, the origins of human language as there's a lot of work or writing I've read where it talks about human language coming from music, you know. How about origins of human music? And I'm going to quote David Rothenberg from his book, Bug Music, How Insects Gave Us Rhythm and Noise. I'd love to get your take on this quote. Insects may be the very source of our interest in rhythm, the beat, the regular thrum. Bold claim. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean pre-technologies, mm -hmm. pre-mechanized technologies that we have today, like such as like this fan that's right next to me kind of has like a regular sound pattern to it. I'd say, yeah, like, I mean, and I wasn't around to know. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like before we developed all these like mechanical technologies, um, these self-operating things, um that insects probably were the most like regular sounding i mean there's other organisms too like frogs sometimes birds 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 yeah i feel like birds have a there's something about insects that's like or i mean there's such a wide variety of bird sounds and some birds mm -hmm. have a more regular rhythm than others but they definitely have rhythms and patterns to learn so i would say it's not really necessarily i mean of course i'm drawn to the insect sound but i think there's patterns in other organisms too that probably informed us um but yeah without the insect i feel like the insects are a huge part of it so how do you go about recording your ants and other insects yeah um so especially when you're dealing with subterranean organisms mm -hmm. here you're you're capturing interactions, burrowing, gardening by acromyrmics or atta, uh, mm -hmm. as well as stridulation where they're rubbing one body part against another. Yeah. So um, one of the most important tool is a contact microphone. So a contact microphone um, has as its, I have, at its core, um, this piezo element, so that is like a pressure sensitive element. Um, so, and they pick up, they're specialized for picking up vibrations. So picking up sound through vibration as opposed to picking up sound through the air. Now, like sound and music, there's a very fuzzy border. Also between vibratory sound and airborne sound, there isn't like a hard boundary. Like if um, someone yells really loud, it's going to create vibrations in objects as well as there being sound in the air. Um, and if something creates a loud vibratory sound through a surface, there might be some amount that crosses up into the air. Um, but for the most part, contact mics pick up things, sounds, surface borne, substrate borne vibration. So um, sounds that are moving through substrates so in my case this is the soil or vegetation usually um and so i take contact mics of different sizes and forms and put them in soil environments or clip them mm -hmm. to vibratory substrates so um uh decomposing wood in different stages um or if i see ants like if i see um a trail of army ants moving and they're going over like some like pieces some fragments of vegetation mm -hmm. i'll put a contact mic and click it clip it so that it picks up their locomotion sounds as they're moving by um if there are ants on a plant like there's a lot of plants in manaus that have real um domatia they offer this domatia to ants um 
and um and Melissa Meishi actually some and my collaborator Erica has been looking for ants that live in these domesia and recording them and so she clips the content oh. like plant right by the domesia yeah um and um so then they just put them in the soil actually this is he said something earlier that reminded me of this having a search image like a visual search image yeah. for birds or something you might look at certain places there is like this sonic oral notion of like using vision to find places that might have sounds so like looking at like a kind of fluffy thick leaf litter you know and saying like, oh there's definitely things living in there <laughs> right there for a while and stick some microphones in there and see what and see what I hear, hear what I hear, <laughs> yeah. listen to what I hear. Um, so yeah, the search, the visual search elements could kind of aid in the sound search a lot of the time. Can I? It's got I, away from the question, yeah. but I don't know, I think I, did I answer it? <laughs> yeah, I, basically to get a feel for your methods. Yeah, how, yeah, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, how you approach uh yeah. capturing what might be subterranean or within the leaf litter, something hidden to us, not only visually, but especially acoustically. Yeah. And, so, mm -hmm. and you were making a distinction between, say, far field sound, and some insects use near field sound within, say, a few millimeters, and substrate borne vibrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and they might yeah, please. Them far field sound as substrate borne vibrations in the soil there. And I've been using different microphones to pick that up. I have a microphone called a geophone, which is like a adapted from um, a seismologist's really highly sensitive microphone to a version that is accessible and usable by field recordists like me. And it picks up more of the low end sounds, huh. um, low end vibrations. And it has like a spike. So it's really easy to just stick it into the soil or the leaf litter. And um, or at the base of a tree. And with this microphone, my intention is not necessarily to pick up the insect sound, but to pick up this low end vibration, such as cars driving by or like lawn care machinery that might be rumbling um, through the soil near where the insects are living. So it's like what sounds that humans are making or that other organisms are making are reaching, or maybe like a nearby stream. How's that sound reaching the insect habitat? And that's one of several ways where your work departs greatly from Paine's, from Bernie Krause's, and others who have recorded natural sounds, because you're not separating humans from nature, you're including those noises, ambient, human-induced, or human-created, and I find that interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing that because... Um... Well, I find them interesting that they exist parallel to each other. Hmm. And I think by showing them parallel to each other, it's more likely that people will consider this parallel sound world in their day to day. So because, um, you, you know, if we have the car sound in my composition and the hidden insect sound, and then you just hear the car sound in your environment, you're like, oh, wait, there's a hidden insect sound. And that car sound might be being sensed by those insects so there's like this and so there's that but then there's also um a tendency in art um to try and i understand this to try and capture these pristine and using the word pristine in quotes because there's no such thing but these pristine soundscapes right mm. um in these pristine locations so this word pristine implies in these cases without humans disturbance um and like that is not the planet that we live on like humans are part of the planet have been part of the planet so this not only erases erases human presence in these places and is based on like a western centric perspective because we're western humans aren't in these places um but it also positions us as separate mm -hmm. separated from these places and it kind of like positions us as bad. So like, of course we do it like those terrible things. We've caused climate change and all this stuff, but there, it kind of erases any hope that we could do good. So is it like, if humans equal bad, human sound equals disturbance, 
we don't pristine equals without human sound then it's like kind of like where is the hope that we could be present and could be part of these places in a positive way um so yeah so i like to put us there it's like we're part of it like we have to change how we're being part of it in most cases but we're, we're with us we're not separate um yeah I'm going to read something that further explores your breaking down of us versus them. And it's from text scores for getting to know the invertebrates. Oh, cool. So of the many invertebrates you talk about, night singers, text score for temperate regions. Begin this ritual on July 15th. Once it is dark, walk to the nearest area of vegetation. Listen. Did the insects start to sing yet? Check each evening until you hear them. The first night they call, listen for 10 minutes. Focus on one type of call. Expand to the full soundscape. Focus on a single insect caller. How do they sing with human sounds? Repeat nightly. In the fall, notice the decrease in singers. Continue nightly until they stop singing. Visit one more night to make sure they've stopped. And you include an area for listening notes and observations, and each page is similar in that vein. And I see this as a meditative approach to embracing, respecting, potentially celebrating, or at, l at the very least tolerating those <laughs> omnipresent invertebrates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that your intent making this? Yeah. Um, so that most of that publication stemmed from um, me moving to New York from the West Coast during the pandemic and um, being in a place um, without a car, um, which really like most of the heavily wooded places in upstate New York require some kind of car to get to uh, most of the places that are away from the city. Mm -hmm. And so it really got me to focus on the vegetation and the environments that are right here that I'm living with mm -hmm. next to. Um, and so that book is all about, the booklet, the publication is all about um, getting to know insects through listening in urban places, but also like in your house. Um, I was having experiences with insects as I, we always have, you know, but I started paying a lot more attention to them. I had a lot more time too, because we we're still in different forms of lockdown. So there was like less drawing me away from my house. Um, and, and, so my, and my sense is that it, it, it wasn't even, maybe I'm totally wrong, but it wasn't for you because you appreciate invertebrates, but maybe for others to reflect on their relationships with yeah. domestic insects. Yeah. I mean, I already appreciated them, but I was paying even more attention mm. to them. Um, and yeah, and I had recently been reading tech scores by Pauline Oliveros. She's written a lot of tech scores that are meant, it's a performative thing but anybody can do it. You don't need musical experience. And so I wrote these as performances that anyone can do even in their house or nearby their house, um, nearby where they live. And so, yeah, it was an effort to basically prompt a slowing down and like, there's a lot of breathing in there. Yes. Um, um, so, and there's, so a groundingness and a presence instead of like, people's most people's reaction to the invertebrates and insects and there are just like a fear and a quick getting away and a like um a franticness and an anxiety um so it's the opposite of it and it's just like actually taking time to actually like consider what the threat is or if they even what is a threat yeah and there's i have to say though there's one tech score in there that was meant for me because i um the house like um, uh, house centipede yeah the house centipede so um i grew up in staten island i remember 
we had a ritual we didn't ever say let's have this ritual but like me and my friends when we were little if we ever saw a house in Tahiti which happened a lot we'd all like scream and like jump <laughs> on the bed and then where's the vacuum <laughs> <laughs> And like, this is like from someone who's like, <laughs> like, I loved like walking around on bushes and looking for ladybugs and like looking for butterflies <laughs> in the yard. But like this house sensitivity. <laughs> so I had this like embedded fear of mm -hmm. them. Um, and so, and I, there were plenty in this apartment that I had. There were so many and they'd always show up in the shower when I got in there. And I just like at first, like, you know, would flinch. And I said, like, why do I, what? What, what is this? Like, I need to like work on this. So I did. It's, it was an exercise for me to um, become more comfortable with them. And I did. So, yeah. Has any, has any reader reported back to you? People have said that they, they did use those and it helped them pay more attention. Oh, really? But no one said that they, actually, people have said the opposite, but the house sense people like, I don't know about that one, you know, but I have faith. <laughs> so I wanted I wanted to potentially close with a few candidates and for you to come and to reflect on the prospect of working with insect musicians that you may not have already. So for example, have you worked with tree hoppers? Yes. Um but yeah. so I always use my sound, my, my, the sounds that I've collected, um, except in this one case, I wrote a composition using sounds that an entomologist, Rex Cocroft. Rex Cocroft? All right. Yeah. And how about, how about stoneflies? Um, I've never used them. I don't think I've straight born vibrations. They drum during courtship. Oh my God, really? Okay, this is on my list. I've never, <laughs> I might have heard them and not even known. Yeah. And I, I you, you might have, I spent a, a few weeks this summer, also in upstate New York, and I've watched honeybees a lot yeah. performing waggle dances. And you hear them buzzing, you hear basically a cacophony. Occasionally, if you really zero in, you can hear specific sounds, signals, mm -hmm. communications. Yeah. But this time, I wore headphones and I had a little microphone, yeah. a micro directional mic, and I removed the glass and instead used tool through which I could more easily see and especially record the sounds. And wow, it was a different world for me. I was working with an undergraduate student, Erin Roop, and she was basically in a relatively silent world. And here for hours, I was immersed in this colony's activities acoustically, yeah. and it changed everything. So yeah. recordings of, and I wonder if you'd be interested in exploring the sounds produced that involve piping signals uh waggle dancing and other signals that are acoustically distinct like tremble dance yeah i the... would love to and actually um it's funny like having studied the hyleus my attention had been focused mainly on um the solitary bees and like native bees or is that you know honeybees not native to the u.s um but two years ago, um, an artist asked me to record bees for a work that she had coming up at the um, museum at MIT. And um, so I went to meet a beekeeper in Queens, in Astoria, Queens, that she connected me with. Um, oh. On his roof, he had six colonies of bees. And I had a similar experience to you, like I had never listened to them closely. And we stuck contact microphones and also very small condenser mics in and around these hives it was incredible and i didn't categorize the sounds yeah. but i do want to return to those and work with them more and am i am i correct that because ants and other hymenoptera as yet have not demonstrated 
to human scientists, far field sound reception, mm -hmm. um, that you haven't spent a lot of time with the actual singing insects, right? Katydids, grasshoppers, crickets, cicadas in your works. Why is that? Um, because, well, katydids do have like ultrasonic components that mm. I've heard with like um, a special uh -huh. ultrasonic mic sometimes. Um, and sometimes, you know, you see the katydids and or bats and like in that zone um, at night. But um, I just, I have okay. Them, but I'm focused on the hidden sounds. And so those usually are more conspicuous. So yeah, but um, but I actually have in some works recorded like cricket soundscapes, like thick cricket soundscapes, and then cut out the component that was it within our audible range of hearing and included only the ultrasonic component and then bring, brought that down to, to our hearing. So I've done that. And there are several researchers who have exposed the hidden percussive substrate borne vibrations of salticid jumping spiders courting. Yeah. For example, one researcher will spread, stretch nylon pantyhose over an open, basically making a drum. Wow. And the jumping spider on this pantyhose will wave tufts of on the forelegs. So visual display. And then drum in a species specific fashion the courtship this is and, so okay. and i'll i can uh send you names of several researchers who have done really amazing research with the jumping spiders and and their array of sound That's produced in courtship incredible. yeah i know hardly anything about spider sound um there's this amazing guy thomas saraceno who's done a lot oh of yes Right, the web works. Um, yeah. Um, so most of what I know is actually through his work. Uh, uh, yeah. And lastly, and maybe most peculiarly and most difficult to attain, how about a bevy of extinct insects with their extinct sounds? Yeah. I, I know of one superb example and uh, Junji Gu et al. published a paper a handful of years ago, which I'll send you, in which a male Katie did is fossilized exquisitely in terms of his front wings. And with those wings, you find not only the stridulatory band, but the pluck, and they can go from one wing over the other or switch. And they're so beautifully preserved that they recreated, they replicated, they uh, rediscovered an extinct sound as part of a larger soundscape from 165 million years ago. Wow. It's really beautiful. That's incredible. So and Unusually, they published in the in the paper itself a little video that gives uh, the ambiance of that scene, but more importantly, the song that had not been heard for 165 million years. The song, so the actual pattern of the song too? That's right. So they basically replayed it from the what they know of the fossil morphology and extant relatives uh, okay. today. And so, so they, they kind of, so they got like the the actual like timbre of the sound from the and maybe the length of the sound, but then the actual like more meta pattern from the extant. Which which of course at least the frequency will vary based on temperature, but at least you have that tempo. Yeah. Whoa, that's so cool. I'm going to look that huh? up. That's an amazing like, realm that I'd love to work in. That's super cool. And I know you're about to zip off back to Brazil. Can yeah. you give us um, hints and glimpses of what you're 
future may hold? Yeah, so I'm going to Brazil, to Manaus, Brazil, to attend the International Ant Symposium. And there's myrmecologists flying in from, or um, taking boats in from all over Brazil and the world. And um, we'll be there for about a week celebrating uh, ants and sharing ant knowledge. And for my part, um, I've been working with entomologist Fabricio Baccaro and Erica Valle and bioacoustician Tainara Sabrosa in Manaus on ant bioacoustic research for several years. So I'm going to present some music that I've made from that project in a live performance, live solo performance in the Bosque de Ciencia Park in Manaus. And I'll present a lecture of my work. So and how exciting. So I'm really excited to be with everybody there. And I'll have a chance to go in the field with some myrmecologists before and after myrmecologists who I haven't met before. Um, and I'm just excited to learn together and um, really excited to be doing this. I mean, I do have a, his, a history of doing biology work and a background in entomology, but it's really exciting to be in these positions as an artist, as a musician, um, working together with scientists. And we have this common thread of being really excited about ants. And yeah. And while you're identifying benefits for you, I'm sure the scientists are reaping benefits in terms of potentially outreach, communicating their science to others through art. Is that right? Yeah. And that's something that's been really amazing through working with Fabricio and Erica and Tainara together is um, I'm able to like really reach broad audiences through art that science has more limited means to reach that. Like we depend on like this big press release or something, whereas music, you can reach these little small audiences through shows or installations or through radio, you know, reach huge audiences through radio and internet. So kudos to you for spreading entomophilia in the ways you do. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining, Lisa. And I really appreciate our conversation. Great questions. Yay. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.